Hey guys, we finally have a few things to update you on. We're cramming quite a bit into this video, so hang in there. Basically, I wanna go over laying out our panel, cutting the panel, labeling, where and how we installed all the electrical components, batteries, contactors, switches, Garmin LRUs, etc. Probably not in that order, but stick around and we'll go through them. All right, first up are the batteries. To mount the main battery and the contactors, I tried my best to copy what Colin did on the prototype. We did this by making a battery box that will mount to the fuselage tubing in the boot cowl area on the right side. First, we formed the back side of the box and then attached an off-the-shelf battery box from EarthX on the inside. Before attaching the aft side, I confirmed that the setback wouldn't get into the boot cowl. Then I drilled the box to a piece of aluminum angle. Once the box was painted, I added nut plates to hold the inside piece to the back piece. This will allow for removal of the battery with four bolts. Next, I marked and drilled the holes for where the starter and master contactors will mount. Afterwards, I bolted everything in place. My electrical system is using a small backup battery, mostly because we'll be using electronic ignition. I decided to mount the backup battery under the left seat on the floorboard. Our floorboards are reinforced in this area to accommodate the pitch servo we'll show you next in this video. To make slots in the floorboards, I drilled holes at both ends of the short lines and then made cuts with a straight edge and a roto zip. Then I added angles with pull rivets that will hold the battery in place on either side. To secure the battery, I used Velcro straps that pass through the floorboards via the slots I cut. Next up, we'll run through what Garmin calls Line Replaceable Units, or LRUs, starting with the autopilot servos. Installing a yaw servo was more involved than I wanted to tackle, so we're just going with a two-axis autopilot for now. We put the pitch servo under the right seat. I started by installing some aluminum angles to be the mounting structure. For this servo, I purchased one of the Garmin generic servo brackets. I aligned the bracket and then drilled it in place. Then I drilled through the floorboards and through the angles and installed nut plates on the bottom side. I added screws along here to help ensure the angles would stay in place. Once the servo was installed, I worked to connect it to the elevator bell crank. The first thing I did was make a bushing where it'll attach to the bell crank. This should be a pretty simple task for someone with basic machine shop tools, but was a little bit more of a challenge for me. I started by cutting a piece off of round bar stock. Then I clamped a piece of scrap wood to my drill press table and drilled a hole to accommodate the bushing. Making provisions to preserve the exact location of the table, I swapped out the drill bit in the drill press and drilled the hole for the bushing. Not a recommended technique, but it got the job done for us. I was worried about employing a similar technique to make the connecting rods. Fortunately, fellow Bearhawk builder and friend Shu bailed us out and made them for us. I sent him rough measurements and he made them for us on his lathe, intentionally leaving them a little long. Then I cut them to the exact length and tapped the holes he drilled for us. Once finished, the connecting rod is installed with jam nuts on either end. We installed the roll servo in the triangle under the left seat. We made this bracket out of eighth inch aluminum. 
We printed off the recommended bracket cutout dimensions drawing from the Garmin documentation and stuck it to the piece of aluminum. We used this drawing to mark and drill all of the holes used for mounting the servo. Then we mounted it to the fuselage tubing under the left seat with the Dell clamps. After it was placed where I needed it to be, I marked and cut off any excess, cleaned it up, and painted it before final installation. To mount many of the electrical components, we filled the left and right triangles behind the panel with aluminum. We used .04 aluminum sheet metal and Adele clamps. Then I mounted as many components to these sheets as I could. We put the GPS position source and the EIS on the underside on the left and the comm radio on top on that side. We put electrical buses under the right side and our ignition ECU on the top over there. We put the audio panel and the electronic controller on the left side. Initially, I was planning to mount the air data sensor unit directly to the back of one of the GDUs. But then I read in the documentation that this installation location is not generally recommended. I reached out to Garmin and they were concerned with the flex in the thin instrument panel I'm using provided with the kit and recommended I don't install it there. So I decided to mount it to a piece of eighth inch aluminum in the triangle under the right seat. Next, I brought the static source from the back up to the GSU. We ran it under the floor and used a combination of Adele clamps and snap bushings to secure it. Then we drilled through the floorboards where it needed to penetrate and used a snap bushing to protect it. Next, we mounted a carbon dioxide detector to the bulkhead between the front and second row of seats. This one has independent warnings and also interfaces with the G3X system for audio warnings through the headset and on-screen display. Probably a bit overboard since you can get the panel stickers for a few bucks, but I'm trusting Dakota's life in this thing, so we're taking carbon monoxide detection seriously. Trying to stick to my theme of having as clean of a panel as possible, I decided to put the light switches overhead. We did this by making a panel out of 032 aluminum. I bent up the edges to make for a more finished look and add rigidity. For labeling, we used vinyl. First, I applied a sheet of white vinyl. Then, using a hobbyist vinyl cutter machine, we cut out the labels for the switches out of black vinyl. Then, I picked out the pieces, applied some transfer tape, and stuck the vinyl to the panel. I marked the switch holes on the vinyl and drilled them out after applying the vinyl rather than trying to perfectly align the vinyl with pre-existing holes. To finish up, I installed the switches and a map light. Before installing the panel completely, I hooked up the switch wires and then secured the panel with four Adele clamps. Hindsight, I wish I would have laid out my panel in CAD and had it cut with a CNC service before making my boot cow. That would have saved me a fair bit of work. I could have went with thicker aluminum for the panel and it would be easy to cut a new one and bolt it in place if I want to make changes in the future. But lacking the foresight, this is how we went about it. First, I took a picture of the blank panel trying to minimize any distortion. Then, I brought the image into SketchUp and scaled it. I chose to use SketchUp because it has a free version and is user-friendly to non-CAD people like myself. Once confirming all of the measurements on the scaled photo were true to the physical panel, I digitized a layer to represent the panel.
From there, I started laying out our panel. Many of the Garmin products have CAD files for their components that can be downloaded and loaded directly. If using SketchUp, you do need to have the first tier of their paid subscription. Then, most of the other components had drawings in the documentation that were easy to sketch out with their specified measurements. One final thing I did was make several reference points that we'll use in the next step. After I was happy, I exported the panel layout as a DXF file. This DXF file can then be brought directly into a vector graphic editor. I used Inkscape just because it was free. My first objective was to print a template out to use as a guide to cut the panel. The printer I had access to's largest paper size was 11 by 17, so I defined those boundaries in Inkscape after importing the DXF file. With this paper size, I had to export the layout to three separate sheets, keeping overlap at the reference points I added. After printing, I used a needle to poke through the overlapping reference points and align them perfectly before taping the sheets together. Next, I sprayed some spray adhesive on the back side and we positioned it on the panel. With the template on the panel, we started to cut it out. We drilled whenever possible, used a cutter bit and a dremel in places, and always left the last little bit of the line to be filed up to. We also used a hacksaw, a jigsaw for most of the long lines, and a cutoff wheel and a grinder. We just tried to use whatever we thought was the best tool that we had for the specific cut. Going really slow and always erring on the side of extra work to file up to get to the final cut line was kind of the method we used. Once I was finished with the template, I peeled it off and cleaned the glue residue off with acetone. The GDU screens came with nut plate kits. I match drilled holes for these, countersunk the rivet holes, and riveted them on. Next up was labeling the panel. I went back into Inkscape to do this. First, I set the paper size to be slightly larger than the panel, but aligned the bottom of the panel layout to be where the bend is on the physical panel. And then I turned on a grid of layout lines to aid in the alignment of the labels. Labeling was fairly straightforward. I just added text, specified the font and font size I desired, and then positioned the final text. There were a few spots that had other shapes that were needed. For example, the emblems I used for the cabin heat dials. I drew these using the Bezier tool. This allows for drawing smooth curves. Once I was happy with all of the labels, I exported two versions of the panel. A cut file, where I turned off all the labels, and a print file, which was everything else. We decided to have the panel labels engraved in wood veneer. I found a lady locally with the machine and the skills to make this pretty easy. I purchased the wood veneer that I wanted to use that came with a 3M peel and stick adhesive backing. Then Leanne used her machine to engrave the labels and also cut clear through where the panel components penetrate. To apply the veneer, I simply filled a few of the holes to aid in the alignment and then stuck the veneer on. Since I digitized the panel outline from a photograph, I was concerned about achieving a perfect fit on the edges. 
So I left extra around the top and the edges rather than having those machine cut. Then once it was applied, I cut the excess off with a utility knife so it was perfectly flush all the way around. For the angled portion at the top of the panel, I made a trim piece. A lot of directions I could have went here, and I'm sure this was probably the silliest option, but I think it ties the panel together with the stick grips nicely. The veneer on the top and the trim piece were both finished with polyurethane. I used a water-based poly because I don't like how oil-based polys yellow maple over time. After the finish was dry, I put the panel in place. The trim piece is held on with the same screws the panel is attached at the base with. Once the panel was in place, I started installing all of the components. On the left side, we put our ignition programmer, an air vent, the ELT remote control panel indicator, park brake control, and a headset jack. In the center, we mostly have switches and wide open spaces. We have poles for the engine controls at the base, and then also dials for heat control. The switches were all straightforward to install, and we used padded jaw pliers to tighten them. The cabin heat controllers we were using have an indexing pin that needs to have a small hole drilled to accommodate and then line up with to prevent rotation. The GDU screens simply mounted in place with four screws. All right, I think that's everything I wanted to cram into this video. We're still waiting on our transponder, so I'll have to show you where we end up putting that in a future video. It's been a little slow going lately. As you saw, most of these LRUs and electrical components require fabricating some sort of little custom bracket or a way to mount them. Turns out this is not my strong suit. So it took me several tries for many of these things. We've also been suffering from slow supply chain issues like I'm sure everyone else is. We were told we'd have all of our avionics almost eight months ago, so we've had some serious delays there. But the transponder is the last outstanding item, so we'll plan to update you guys on the wiring in another six months or so. I'm just kidding, hopefully it doesn't take that long, but I guess we'll see. The engine shop doing an overhaul for us initially estimated our engine would be done over nine months ago now, and we're still waiting on that as well. But probably a significant contributing factor to our slow progress was having a little too much fun this last fall and summer. So we'll leave you with some of the highlights and hope for full speed ahead the rest of this winter and into the spring. We'll see you guys in the next one.